Hello and welcome to this program guide video on how to program an analog clock on the PIC16F 1455 microcontroller. If you haven't seen the main video yet, then I recommend you to watch it first because this video right here focuses only on the C source code for the PIC16F 1455 microcontroller using the XC8 compiler. And if you have never programmed a PIC microcontroller before, I also invite you to check out my PIC introduction video. This here is the complete source code that makes the PIC16F1455 work as an analog clock and as you can see it has many different parts. If you want to understand this finished code all in one, check out the companion article on friendlywire.com where we go through the code in a lot of detail. And in this video here, and it's going to be a long one, we will write this code together line by line and see what everything does step by step. So if you want to follow along, build this circuit on a breadboard as described in the main video and connect it to the PicKit 3. Plug the PicKit 3 into your computer and start the MPLAB 10 IDE. Next, set up a new standalone project for the PIC16F 1455 and then create a new but empty main.c source file like this. Also start the MPLAB IPE, select the PIC16F 1455 as the device and the PicKit 3 as the tool and after clicking connect, the PIC should be detected like this. And if this is all a bit confusing, then don't worry about it and go check out my fully detailed video on the MPLAB IDE, IPE and so on. And finally open the PIC16F1455 datasheet, which you can download in the companion article. Now we're all set and I will be switching freely between these three windows for the rest of this video. All right, so the first thing we have to do is actually set up the PIC in our default configuration. And we do this under window and then target memory views and then configuration bits. And you see there's a whole bunch of options that we can choose from and they all tell you different options of how the PIC 16F1455 works. And the most important thing for us is that an internal oscillator has to be turned on. Then we have to make sure that the master clear pin is turned off. And then the last thing we have to do is the low voltage programming mode has to be off because we won't be using that. Now there's a bunch of other stuff here that we can all turn off because this is advanced, advanced functionality that will just draw additional power and in our case we don't really need any of this because we want to have something that works well in sleep mode so that consumes as little power as possible. So we have changed all these values here and now we click on generate source code to output and it looks like it hasn't done anything but you just have to scroll down here and move this one up and there you see this is the source code that it just generated and it gives us the two configuration bits exactly the way that we want them. And we'll keep the output something like this here because we'll be looking at this later as well. And then just paste it in here and that is pretty much all done. Now the next thing we have to do is have to look at this main function here and what I usually do main function in the main part of the program is create a main loop and the main loop is the loop that's going to be executed over and over and over again. So we just have an endless, an infinite loop here, oh, oops, like this, while one that always evaluates to true. So this will always, always, always be executed over and over and over again. Now we can program this, actually compile this up here. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And then we'll see here, see here build successful. And this is where this new hex file that this code was just turned into is located. And we can switch over to the MPLAB IPE and browse to that file to make sure that we can actually flash this onto our controller, just to make sure that the infrastructure that we have set up here is uh, working properly, sort of. And there we go, we just loaded this hex file. And now we can click on program because we have selected the pick here and the, also the picket three and it's connected. We can click on program and then hopefully should tell us down here it's programming and some point should tell us that it has been complete. There you go, programming complete and the hex file is now on our PIC controller. And we can just have a look at this controller and see what it does. And well, of course it doesn't do anything and that's expected. And that's because just the main loop is still empty. Okay, so the first order of business is to make sure that we can talk to our LEDs properly and also to our switches. And the first thing I always do is I define some abbreviations abbreviations that are just useful for us to keep track of where stuff is located. So for example, LED1 is located at pin RC4. LED2 is located at pin RC3. LED3 is located at pin RC2. And LED4 is located at pin RC0. 
And then we also have our buttons, our push buttons. So this is a switch on, and this one is located at RC1. There's the switch up that is located at RA1. And then there is the switch down, which is located at RA0. This is just the locations that I chose for this and I make it kind of easy to track later where stuff is. Anyway, now we have to make sure that we set the correct IO directions for these things because so far the controller doesn't know if these are inputs and outputs. Also there's, oh, there's a little typo here, there you go. Just uh, makes me feel a bit better. We have to configure the IO pins to be well inputs or outputs. And what we want to do for this is we have to make sure that the LEDs are all outputs and the switches are all inputs. So let's go through and set the tri-state registers accordingly. So tri-state C4 is equal to zero, means it's going to be an output. Tri-state 3.3, C3 is an output as well. Tri-state 3.2 is an output as well. Tri-state 3.0 is an output as well. And then we have tri-state C1 is an input because that's where the first push button is. Tri-state, um, now it's gonna be A, A0 is an input as well. And then tri-state A1 is an input as well. So this is what we have to do here. And there we run into our first problem because while these things are fine, it underlines these two in red. And it does that because it doesn't really know what it means to say tri-state A0 or tri-state A1. And that is perhaps a little bit confusing because you know why are we not able to set these two inputs and outputs? And the reason as always is in the data sheet. So let's have a look at that one. So I have it open right here. We can go to the table of contents and look at the section that is on the IO ports. That is chapter 12 in this whole data sheet. So this data sheet has a lot of different information, of course, but we actually are interested in port A. Yeah, and if you scroll into the beginning of this data sheet here at the for the port A registers, you actually see the statement here. The exception is RA0, RA1, and RA3, which are input only and the tri-state bits will always read as one. So that's why these things really don't exist. And that's why we can just go back into the source code here and forget about those two lines. Now, before we forget about this, there is also another pin, which is RC5. And that will be an output later on because that's where we will generate our PWM type voltage for our panel meter. So let's make this one an output as well. Now, if you look at the data sheet for port C, you actually find out that there is additional functionality that is related to the analog to digital converter that the PIC16F1455 has. And we have to make sure that we turn off the corresponding bits in this ANSELC register and that is register 12-15 and there you go we see that there are certain pins uh, certain bits in here i should say for example ansc analog selection register bit for c0 for example that means if that bit is set pin rc0 will be handled as if it was an analog input well we don't really want that so we have to make sure that we turn all these corresponding things off because we really want to be using them as digital outputs for our leds so that's why i'm going in here and I'm going to turn this one off. All of them that are applicable and ANSC1 is equal to zero as well. Actually, I made a mistake here. You see that ANSC4 doesn't exist and we see here only zero, one, two, three, and uh, well, these two are actually only applicable for the PIC16F1459, which we are not using today. Um, as for this uh, little footnote here means, but these are the ones that we want to turn off. So zero, one, two, and three. Let's go back in here. Zero, this one. Turn this off as well. Oops. Now let's put this next to the zero pin. Zero, one, two, three, and then four. It doesn't have this additional functionality. Okay, here we go. Now everything is basically set and we, we don't really have to worry about anything. But now of course the question is, uh, how can we make this sort of like more interesting and I can actually check in between that we know what we're doing. And the first thing I really wanna do is just turn all the LEDs on. And we will be thinking, and we'll worry about the push buttons a little bit later. So two, three, and four, all these LEDs are on permanently. That's what we kind of want here. Let's just compile this code and create a new hex file. And then you see there's this new message here that shows up and that's the message that actually comes well, from the IPE, and it notices that the hex file has been modified and we, it asks us if we want to load a new one and say, of course, we do want to refresh the new hex file and we can click on program here again. And once we do that, all these four LEDs which should just turn on permanently on our breadboard. And it's just a really good way to check that we know what we're doing. 
And if you look at the breadboard, yeah, that's actually what they do. So we are good to go. But because I don't want these LEDs to be on permanently because it kind of drains the battery, I'll just click on erase right here. I'll erase the hex file from the pick again. And then these LEDs should turn off again. And that's what they do. And that means we have some more time now to work on the next steps of our program without killing the batteries too early. Now back in the program, what we want to do now is we want to first erase these old lines and we want to react to the push buttons. And we have three push buttons and we have four LEDs. So let's just use three push buttons to toggle three of these LEDs just to see that the push buttons are actually working. So one easy way to do this is to just write if switch on then. That's basically the statement here that's executed whenever switch on. And remember that is the location of one of our push buttons here at RC1. If this evaluates to true, and in this case, we'll just toggle LED1. We'll write it like this, which is basically a nice way, oops, like this, that takes the value of LED1 and maps to one minus of that value. So if it's one, it gets mapped to zero. If it is zero, it gets mapped to one. In other words, it just toggles this thing. And now we can do the same thing for the other buttons as well. So we have the up button and we have the down button. And of course, then we want to toggle LED2. And here we want to toggle LED3. And that's our still our main program. Not a whole lot happening here. Let's just recompile this. And there you go. And then we will say, yes, let's refresh this file and program it again. Now let's just see what happens on the breadboard. And all the LEDs should be off. But now the difference should be that if we press these buttons, these LEDs actually get toggled. But hey, what's happening here? We can't really see that, right? I mean, it looks like they're just getting dimmer, but they don't get toggled. And what's the reason? Well, the reason is that uh, this condition evaluates to true whenever the button is pushed. But that means if it's pushed and this line gets evaluated like 27,000 times a second, for example, well, then this line also gets evaluated 27,000 times a second. And we don't really want that. What we want is we want to sort of debounce this or we want this to only react once or only a certain amount of times in a given time scale. And so what we have to do is we have to find a way to debounce these buttons. So there's probably better ways to do this. I do this in the following way. I define these so-called debouncing variables and I just make them integers just to keep our life simple. And I call them buffer variables like this. And for each button, we have one of them. So we have one for on, one for up, and one for down. And they're all equal to zero. So let's take this first value here and go in here and add a condition. Now this should only be evaluated if this buffer variable evaluates to zero. And then we need two more parentheses like this. And of course, then this means nothing at this point. But in this case, we will just set this variable to a higher value, let's say 500 something like this. And what does it do? Well, in this case, it only gets evaluated once because the problem is now, of course, <laughs> this variable is set to 500 once it has been evaluated once and it can never be evaluated again. So that's not really what we want. So what we have to do here is we have to say, we have to clear our debouncing variables. So we can just say if switch on buffer is positive, then we just decrease this value by one. And what that means is that after this loop has been cycled through 500 times, it'll be back to zero again. Now you can imagine that we have to do the same thing for these other ones as well. Like this, like this, like this. And then we just have to basically put these things in here as well. These additional if statements up, up and down down and then of course also this last line up and down there you go and this should now help us to actually make sure that these things don't trigger all the time but only every 500 loop cycles in the main loop so let's program this and see what happens yeah and if we look at our breadboard and we just do this thing now you can actually toggle them quite comfortably but of course also one thing that you see is when you hold one of these push buttons pressed and it's actually going to blink. And that is because we didn't put in an additional condition here in the code, for example, that means that we can only uh, decrease this buffer if the button is no longer pressed. So I kind of like this functionality that if you held it pressed, that it actually toggles. But if you wanted, you could say, and not switch up, for example. You could do something like this. And in this case, it would only decrease those values if you let go of the button. So let's see if that works too. Let's just compile this. Oh, I just realized this should be <laughs> this should be on and not not up. But let's recompile this quickly in here. Flash this onto the pick. 
and then let's see what happens. All right, so now one of these buttons should actually toggle when we hold and press. Uh, both of them actually do that, but one of them shouldn't. One of them should actually only do that. There you go. This one only toggles uh, when you press it and you have to release it again. So you could have that functionality in here if you wanted to. We don't really need it for this project and this is why I'm just re uh, removing these lines again here. But that's basically the main idea how to debounce our switches. So now let's talk a little bit about timing because so far all we have done really is have this, we have this main loop, we have debounced our switches and we know that the switches and the LEDs work and that's great, but we don't know how fast our program is running and it's always a good idea to know. And in our case, all we really know is that we're using the internal oscillator, right? And the internal oscillator, well, it runs at a certain frequency and we don't really know what that is. And I would like to have this program run at four megahertz. And the reason is that we want to do pulse width modulation at the end to control the panel meter. And that means the frequency has to be high enough that we get enough resolution into our pulse width modulation signal. Now, let's look at the data sheet to find out how to adjust the internal oscillator frequency and set this to actually the four megahertz that we, that we want. And there we are. Okay, so this chapter talks about the oscillator. And again, there's a lot of information in there that we don't really need. And that's something I was terrified of at the beginning when I looked at these data sheets, right? Because they have 400 pages of all kinds of things. You really have to find the little pearl of wisdom <laughs> that you wanna extract. Otherwise you can spend probably weeks and weeks and weeks reading this whole thing. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna set the internal oscillator frequency to a different value, right? And so we have to just scroll and see what happens. And if you keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and you read just the headlines, you quickly find that there is a section and that I wrote it down here, it's 5224, that's the one that we need. There you go, internal oscillator frequency selection. That's the one that you need. And you see that if all these different options here and 500 kilohertz is the default oscillating frequency after reset which is the one that our code is running at right now, but we want to change it to four megahertz. And you can see here that the registers IRCF three to zero. So these four bits are actually encoding this frequency here because they're set to these values after a reset so that this thing actually knows what to do. Now, what values do these things have to take so that this thing runs at four megahertz? And luckily for us, there is a chapter that talks just about that. And it's, I wrote down this chapter 5.9 register definitions oscillator control and here they are the IRCF bits that we have to set and then here you just see what kind of values do we have to choose for them to run at 4 megahertz and there you go these are the combinations that we need so I'm going to move this over here a little bit so that we can still see this on the right side here and we can go back in here and actually work on our code and what we want to do is we really want to configure this to 4 megahertz so let's do that next I always like to do this right at the beginning. We shouldn't be setting these values in the main loop. Setting them once is certainly enough. So always adding comments is nice. I'll try to keep the comments to minimum in this one because I'm afraid that this video is going to be very long anyway. All right, so we have to set IRCF3 to some value and the way that they're organized on the right side here is the three is a one. So in other words, the, the three is the leftmost register and this is the two, this is the one, this is the zero, right? So they are labeled like this, like uh, binary numbers are. There we go, two, one, and zero. And the only one that's actually a zero is IRCF1. Okay, so if we compile this code now and we run it, then it's gonna run at, well, presumably four megahertz. But what's a good way to figure out if it's really running at four megahertz? And there's a really nice little trick that we can use that at least I like to use a lot, which is we use a, free, a predefined function that makes use of a predefined running frequency here that we can specify like this. So this is four million, and this is a variable that's called crystal frequency. So we're telling the program, hey, we're running at four megahertz. And then we go into the main loop. And for now, let's just forget about our, all our uh, LED nonsense here. And all we want to do is we want to set LED, we want to let, make LED four blink. And we want to make LED four blink because, I mean, you could choose any other LED, LED that we want, but we just want to verify that this whole thing runs at, well, uh, four megahertz. So we told this thing, hey, you're running at four megahertz, but now, we can use this really cool function that's called delay microseconds. And it takes a parameter and we can make it uh, wait for 
500 microseconds. Oh, sorry. Um, am I saying microseconds? Milliseconds, MS. <laughs> so this is waiting for 500 milliseconds, another 500 milliseconds. And what that means is it turns LED4 on, waits a half a second, turns it off again, waits another half a second. So what that means is if this code is really running at four megahertz and we compile this now and look at our LED, it should blink at roughly one hertz. It's a really nice way to figure out if something is really running at four megahertz or not, even if you don't have an oscilloscope. So I'm just flashing this onto the, onto the chip right now. And if we're lucky, then the yellow LED should start blinking. And there you go, it is blinking. And to me, that very much looks like one hertz, which tells us, yes, we're really running at four megahertz. But now that we know that this is actually running at four megahertz, we can delete this again. We can delete this again. We won't actually be using this functionality here as well. So we can just get rid of all of this and now talk about the next steps. And the next step is to make this LED blink at exactly one hertz because we have to create a stable time base for this clock, right? Because that's what we're ultimately programming. It's a clock. And if you look at the schematic, there is this external 32 kilohertz crystal and we want to use that to actually create a stable time base because well, it oscillates exactly 32,768 times per second. And if we count those oscillations, we can use that to extract a very stable one hertz signal. And for that, we will be using what is called timer one. And timer one in the data sheet, let's make this data sheet big again here like this. Zoom out a little bit and go to the top here. Timer one is one of three timers that the PIC16F1455 has. See, this is the one that we want. And it's the one that we want because it's the one that actually also works in sleep mode. And that's the only reason why we're trying to use this. Well, the other reason would be that it also works with the external crystal that we are using to generate this time base. Now, the first thing we wanna do is really, we wanna turn timer one on. And to do this, well, there are these two bits here and we want timer one to be always on. That's the thing. We don't want this to be on sometimes or whatever. So we have to set timer one on, we have to set this to one and timer one that is gate enable, we have to set that to zero because we don't need any gating or anything fancy like this. So let's go into our source code here and actually add those critical lines. So it doesn't really matter, by the way, where we put this. We put this here, we put this here, put this here. So this is really up to your, uh, <laughs> up to your liking. So configure timer one. So the first thing, you wanna turn this thing on. Oops, there you go. And the gate enable should be turned off. So and nothing is red, which means it actually recognizes these symbols here. Let's, let's add some X, for example, like this, and now it should be red, there you go. It's a good way to check it didn't make a mistake. Okay, so now the timer is always on. The next thing I wanna look at is the clock source of the timer, because we have to tell the timer that it has to use this external crystal, right? And for that, we can look at a certain table in this chapter here. If I'm not mistaken, that should be table, uh, well, 20-2 right down here. It's a clock source uh, selection. And we will be using the external clocking. And for this, we have to set these three values here. We have to set timer one clock select to one and zero and the timer one oscillator enable. I can set this actually to, to zero apparently here. So let's do that next. And I can never remember what these things are. So that's why I have these, uh, <laughs> the data sheet here on the, same, on the same screen. And I can just like scroll over here and say timer one uh, CS1 is equal to one timer one CS0 is equal to zero and timer one oscillator enable is zero as well. Oh, and this is just T1 instead. Okay, there you go. See, another good reason why it makes sense to look at this. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> no more typos. And that should look okay. All right, so now we have uh, this all sorted out, but we, of course we want something to happen whenever the timer one overflows. And for that thing to happen, well, we have to cause an interrupt. And there we are, timer one interrupt. That's really what we need. And so timer one has to be set. So see, I mean, we just you just uh, have to like basically just read this it. very, it's basically, I'm telling you the same thing that's written right here. And I know this because I read this five seconds before I was reading this out to you guys. So there's really no secret knowledge involved here. I'm just li literally following these instructions. So timer one on bit has to be set. We already did that. Timer one interrupt enable bit has to be set. So let's do that one. Timer one interrupt enable is equal to one. We did that. And now we have to also set these two bits here. And this is the peripheral interrupt enable bit. And the GIE is the global interrupt enable. So if we don't set these two things, then, well, we can 
enable the interrupt here, but it won't do anything because these things are not enabled. It's sort of like a fail safe, I guess. So let's put these things in here as well. Uh, enable peripheral and global interrupt. So peripheral interrupt enable is equal to one and global interrupt enable is equal to one as well. Now, the last thing we really wanna do, and that's kind of important, is that we wanna use this timer in sleep mode later on. And luck has it that we're already on the right page for this timer operation during sleep. Now, you can just look through this whole list here again, and this is basically the same stuff that we already filled out over here, but we have to be sure that we set this bit here equal to one. That's the only difference to this mode before. This is an inverted bit because it has this overline here. If this thing is zero, it means that the timer only works whenever the main clock is on. It, it works in a synchronous way. We don't want this. We want this timer to always work independent of whether the main program is running or not. And that's why we have to add this last little thing here, T1 sync, and we have to set this to one here and only then it does what it's supposed to do. Also, there is this N here, and there's an N because this is a negated bit or an inverted bit. If I were to do this, it wouldn't know what this thing was. See, it would make it red, but because this bit is defined with an overline, we just put an N in here. That's the convention of this XCA compiler. Okay, so that's a whole lot of talking, and unfortunately, we're not quite done yet because we have to also go to the code again, and uh, at the very bottom, actually, and create the so-called interrupt service routine. That's the place that is called well, whenever an interrupt happens. And this thing is called void interrupt ISR void, like this. Yeah, I know, it looks very beautiful, but that's just what it is called. And now we can actually respond to a timer one overflow. And we do this by checking if a certain bit is set. And the bit is called timer one interrupt flag. That's the bit that is going to be set. And now we have to, at the end, clear the interrupt flag, and these things are called flags as well, if interrupt flag. So why do we have to set this thing to zero here? And the reason is very simple. If we weren't setting this to zero here, we'd just cause it, uh, run it over and over and over again because this condition will still be true. So we always have to clear our interrupt flag. And now all we wanna do is really wanna say LED4 is equal to one, is equal to one minus LED4. And all that that does is actually, let's just write it down. Well, it toggles LED4. And now, let's just put another comment here. This is the interrupt service routine, so we actually know what it does. And now we just compile this whole thing, hope that it works, and there's no error in here. Doesn't look like there is, okay. Let's flash it on the pick and see what happens. And remember, LED4 is the yellow LED, so we can see what it does. Well, it doesn't really do anything. And the reason, when I was coding this, I was really surprised by this. And it turns out the problem is this bit here, timer one oscillator in here. We have to turn this thing on, otherwise it doesn't really work properly. And let's just first verify that this actually works and then look at the data sheet to see what that actually means. It's flashing roughly every two seconds. We'll get back to that in just one second. But we actually see this bit here has to be set. And I was stumped the first time I was looking at this and I'm looking at my notes here and apparently there's a part in the data sheet in chapter 5.5.3. We talk about the general oscillator. Here we are, secondary oscillator. And we see whenever there is an external oscillator that's connected between these device pins, this is the one that we actually have to turn on and otherwise it doesn't work properly. And I find this very confusing because I would have thought that this would be somewhere in the timer mode, but no, it's actually in the oscillator section. So there you go. And maybe somebody in the comments can tell me why this is not confusing. This one took a little while. We go in here and we see this bit here is now set to one and is working just as intended. Okay, so back to the point why the LED here is blinking at two hertz and not at one hertz. And the reason is that the timer, well, it's a 16 bit timer. So basically we have to cut this thing in two and one easy way to do this is we just reset it uh, to 50% of its value. And to do this, there are two values, timer one high and timer one low. And timer one low are the lower eight bits and timer one high are the upper eight bits. And if we wanna set this to exactly one half, 
Well, then we set this to 127 because that way it populates the lower half of the timer value on reset. So that's where the timer is going to start counting. And what that means is it basically starts at already 50% filled. And what that means is it's going to overflow exactly once a second. And if we're right about this, now we can just flash this on here. We should see that our LED is now flashing at one hertz or once a second and not um, every two seconds as before. Yeah, and there you go. That looks like one second to me. And now we're actually very far along because we have our time base. Now back in the code, I actually want to set up some time base variables and I just call them time variables here. And one of them is just an integer t. We'll use this for an animation later on because we want these LEDs to flash. Then there is one for seconds and then there's one for minutes. I think I call it seconds like this. And all we now have to do is when well over one second passes, we actually want to go down here and just replace this and just update the time here. Actually, for now, we can just leave the LED. It doesn't really do as much good to change this or not, but we can just say seconds increase by one and then we just implement basically very simple time-based functions. Some function which means if seconds is larger or equal than 60, well, then we go ahead and um, set the seconds back to zero and increase the minutes. Oops, like this. One day, believe it or not, has 1440 minutes. So if the minutes are larger or equal to 1440, well, then we set the minutes to zero as well. And that's basically our timing functionality here. Well, now that we have the time base in here, what we can actually do is we can actually uh, remove this LED toggling thing here. First thing is we can remove this entire on off button in its entirety because we'll be doing something fancy with this one later because we, this will actually be opened by an external interrupt. We'll talk about this in just one second. But here, the up buffer and the down buffer here, we can actually, uh, the up and the down buttons, we can actually remove the LED toggling and we can actually replace the actual operation that we want this thing to do. Well, and then up, of course, what it means is, well, it increases the time. So let's do that. And we just have to do one thing here. Um, I like to cap this and say if the minutes are less than the maximum value, then increase the value of the minutes. And then in here, we can actually go ahead and decrease the time. And of course, we have to change this if this is greater than zero. And then we decrease the minutes. And that's about it. Now, the buffer value now, because we're increasing the minutes, would probably be a little bit too high. So I actually changed this to 10 so it doesn't take too long to you know, move the needle from the left to the right, or in other words, to increase by 12 hours. If you left this at a 500, it would take you a very long time. <laughs> and we don't want that. But again, that's nice, right? Because we can just program these things ourselves and just change these values. If for some reason you like 13 better and you, or you like 27 better, then you can just do that. And that's the nice thing about programming these controllers yourself, because you can just really decide what is the most user-friendly experience for you, right? And that's one of the things why I really like doing this. Now, one of the things we can do now is because these LEDs don't do anything anymore, we can actually go ahead and animate these LEDs. Because there are the three green LEDs that are blinking along happily, right? And we have to kind of tell them how to do this blinking. So one way to do this is to take actually the timer one high value and remove 128. And we do that because our timer only counts from 127 to 256, right? Because remember, we always reset this back to 127. So this is going to be a value between 1 and 128. And we divide this by 42. And we do that because that's roughly a third of 127. And what that means is that this value t will have values. Remember, t is an integer, right? So it'll have values of 0, 1, or 2. And so what we do here is basically we take up one second and we divide it into three equal pieces. And now we can just say, well, if we're in the first part of this animation here, then what should we do? Well, in this case, please turn LED one on and turn the other ones off. Like this. And now we can just keep playing this game, but we can just ask for other conditions and set if LED is equal to one or if the, uh, sorry, not the LED, if the T variable is equal to one or if it's equal to two. And there you go. This is how you can check very easily in which part of the second we are located. And of course, we also have to change this animation here so that it really cycles through all these three LEDs.
And another one is, of course, we can use now LED4 as a PM indicator, which is really what it was meant to be all the time. Uh, in order to do that, of course, we have to remove this LED4 being toggled here from this interrupt servicing routine. And we can actually replace this with the functionality that was meant to have all the way. So if it's a PM indicator, let's just write it this way, maybe, is it, is it AM? Because if it is AM, well, then it should be off. We can check for AM if the minutes are less than or equal to 720. Oops, there you go. And in this case, it should be off. And otherwise, LED should be on. And that's just one quick and clean way to check whether it's AM or not. And now it, the LEDs are actually doing what they're supposed to do. So if we compile this, we won't actually be seeing this functionality here because the seconds and everything start at zero. But what we will be seeing hopefully is the animation of these three green LEDs. So let's check that next by transferring this hex file onto the controller just to see what happens. And there you go, the green LEDs are blinking along every second. And if you like a different pattern, you can totally do that yourself as well. This is of course just an example. Remember the on switch that I removed from these if statements a couple of minutes ago? And the reason was because, well, these things, well, they should only work whenever the clock is turned on, but the on off button always has to work, even if the clock is in sleep mode, right? Because you use that button to turn the clock back on. So we have to actually access that button in a slightly different way. And the way to do this is to work with an external interrupt. And to do that, we have to look at the data sheet, specifically at the chapter that talks about interrupts. And if I'm not mistaken, that should be chapter eight. See interrupts, there we go. And you see there are certain interrupts that we can use. And the one that we want to be using is the one that's from the INT, from the interrupt pin. And we see here, pin RC1 is actually the interrupt pin. So it exactly does what we want. We go into the code here and we see this is actually pin RC1. That's why this is the on and off button. <laughs> so there you go. But how do we turn this interrupt on? Let's go back into this chapter eight and you see there is two things. There is the INTF, which is the interrupt flag, right? And then there is the INTE, which is the interrupt enable. And the interrupt enable bit, the, the interrupt enable bit is the earned bit that we have to turn on. So we can put this here. And enable external interrupt. And that's all that we really have to do. But of course, now the question is, how do we know that we can actually do it? Well, we have to go to the interrupt service routine to the ISR and we just add another line here and we just ask for this thing. We so that is this one equal to uh, true, INTF, that is the interrupt flag for the internal interrupt. And at the end, we of course, we always have to clear the interrupt flag. And it's just good practice to, you know, make this the first thing you ever do in an interrupt service routine is like you clear it so like this but just to to test if this is actually working we can just say okay let's see we want some visual confirmation that this is that this is actually working so we can say toggle led4 so we can say led4 is equal to 1 minus LED4. and if we compile this we should see something happening to the yellow led when we press the on off button so there we go, and we press the button. And it's a bit hard to see, but the yellow LED is actually flashing. And why is that? Well, it's because we made a mistake, because in the main loop, we still have this stuff here. So of course, let me just comment this one, because what happens is it sets the LED to one here, but then it goes in here and goes immediately. Well, the minutes are zero, so certainly less than 720, sets back to zero again. And that's the reason that it actually flickers and it does that thing here. See, I mean, you learn a lot by, by doing these kind of sessions here. Okay, programming complete, and there you go. Now I can actually turn this LED on if I press it just the right way. If I press it a little bit too long, it's gonna turn it off again. And that's because, of course, this button is not debounced yet, right? So we have not done that yet, like with the other one that we did before. And we'll get back to that in, in, just, in just a minute from now. So, so the external interrupt is working as we intended to work. So we can restore the correct functionality of LED4. We can go back in here and remove this stuff. And we can actually think about the next steps that are necessary in our program. And the next major step that we have to still incorporate is the pulse with modulation functionality. So of course the pulse with modulation, you see this here in chapter 24, 
it uses a timer. It uses timer two to, to drive everything. And it uses PR2, which is the period register of timer two. And there's also a very nice way here to see how this actually works in timer two. So here's the simplified block diagram for timer two. We actually see there's also a prescaler. We don't really need that. We will use the full oscillating frequency that we can get. And then there's this period register two here that we have to work. And there's also post scalar, but we don't really need that too. So most of the advanced functionalities are actually turned off in our case. But let's go back here and actually configure timer two. And then later on configure the PWM module. So these are two sort of like separate tasks. And let's start with the timer two configuration. And to figure out how timer two works properly, there's this register 21-1, which really explains to us what we have to do. So first thing is we want to turn this timer on. So this is timer two on, that's just a bit. And go in here and say timer two on is equal to one. So that's good. So now the timer is on, that's good. We want the prescaler to be zero. So we have to say, set these values here, T2 CKPS, so timer two clock prescale select. This is a bit of a mouthful. We have to set both of these equal to zero. So let me just move this over here. Let me move this one over here. So we see what's going on. And we can set them T to CKPS equal to zero. And there's two bits of them. So there's the one bit, and then there is the other one. And they should both be, oops, they should both be zero. Ah, uh, yes, and the last thing we have to do, just in case, is remember that timer two here has a period register and that period register should be equal to 255. And that is basically related to the fact that our pulse width modulation will be an 8-bit pulse width modulation. Not quite, it will be 10-bit, but there's some additional details in here. But really what we wanna do is we wanna set this PR2 value to 255 just to be safe. So we set this PR2 equal to 255. Okay, now we have to go ahead and configure the PWM module now that this clock source is actually running properly. And to do this, we can go to chapter 24 in the data sheet. Pulse with modulation, there you go. And here's our simplified diagram. We were just dealing with this timer two module here. But if you look at the first figure, you actually see exactly how this PWM works and how the pulse width is actually computed. And the way that it does it, it really compares it to this PR2 value that we just set to 255. So there you see, this is where the resolution of the PWM stage actually comes in. If you look at the other registers that are necessary, there you go. They always have these register definitions here where all these important things are listed. And you see there is PWM XEN for enable, there is the output enable, there is the output value, and then there's also the PWM polarity. And this X, can be either one or two, depending on which PWM output you want to be using. And we will be using PWM one, but the PIC6 and F1455 has two independent PWM channels. So if you want a second one, you can do that too. So what we have to do really is just very simple. So we want the PWM signal to be zero by default, but then we also want this PWM module to be on, right? So we say PWM one output enable, OE is equal to one and we say PWM one on, oops, on is equal to one as well. Um, I missed, missed something up here. PW one uh, EN, sorry, for enable. So now actually what this does, it really just turns this PWM on, but at a zero value. There you go. Now, is there any way for us to test that this whole PWM stuff is working properly? And well, there is one way to do this and we can set this high value here. That's the value between zero and 255. We can just go in here into the main loop for the panel meter and just put this to 127. And that's something in the middle. It's not fully maxed out. It's not fully to zero. It's just something like that. And if we just compile this, we can just have a look and what that will do to our panel meter. So let's flash it on there and just see what happens. Yeah, and you see the panel meter is roughly in the middle which means that, yeah, this, uh, this PWM is actually working as intended. But yeah, that's basically how this works. So it's actually nice. We're at the point where we can basically forget about microcontroller registers because we have everything at our disposal. Of course, now we have to ask ourselves, really, how do we actually make it so that the output voltage corresponds to the time information? And again, we're gonna do this by just a different distinction here. We're gonna take the two different cases here, either AM mode or PM mode. 
and we're going to treat these separately. And what we want to do in the first case is we just take the minutes value and divide it by 3. As you can see, that gives you a value between 0 and 240, but the result is going to be an integer because minute is an integer divided by 3, it's going to give you an integer, but pwm1dch is actually an unsigned character or it's basically one byte. So we do this little typecasting here. And this way it'll convert it into the right data because an integer is much larger than, than a byte. So that just makes the compiler a little bit happier. And what we do here is essentially the same, but nothing really quite different. But all we do is before we do this division, we just subtract 720. And that's all that we really have to do to take our minutes information and convert it into a voltage on the panel meter. You can compile this again, but of course now you don't really see it all that much. But actually, at this point, we're probably able to check that our clock is working for the first time. So let's program this onto the pick and see that we can actually adjust the time. So we should be able to at least increase and decrease the time. And if I do this here, you see that it works already quite well. So this certainly increases it. And I can press the other button here to decrease it again. And you see that it's doing a decent job at this. And if I increase the time a little bit more, and of course it's gonna take a little bit for the, for the needle to go from left to the right, then you will see that the yellow LED turns on eventually as well, because now we are in the PM range of our clock. So that's working just fine. And we're finally at the point where we can talk about the sleep mode. And the sleep mode is really just very simple because all we have to do to set the controller to sleep is to write these lines here. That sets the controller to sleep. But of course, we don't want to do that here. We want to do that somewhere else. And one way to do this, uh, which is the most convenient way that I found, is to define a status variable. And the status variable, I just call this one status on. And this is a variable that is by default is equal to one. And <laughs> it's equal to one because, well, the clock is on by default. And then what we do in here is we make a little if statement that goes around all the output functionality. So if status on, then do all these things here, meaning do all these, these LED things, the PWM output. And all these things, I mean LED animation, they should happen only if the clock is on. Is the clock on? And if the status variable is off, well, if the clock is off, then we can just say, go to sleep. That's how it is, right? Of course, we're not setting the status variable yet. We're actually gonna be doing that in the interrupt service routine whenever the external button is pressed. But of course, if the clock is turned off, we have to make sure that everything is turned off properly, right? So we wanna make sure all the LEDs are off. So LED one has to be zero, two, three, and four. So all the LEDs are turned off. And then we also want to make sure that the PWM module is off as well. So we can set the duty cycle values to zero as well. But then we also want to make sure that this thing is actually disabled. So PWM1 enable is equal to zero. In that case, we can really go back to sleep. And now, of course, if we are awake, we also have to make sure that is everything turned on? And that's important because, well, these values, we're setting them here, we're setting the LEDs down here, but the PWM module itself might be turned off. So we have to say PWM1 enable is equal to one. There you go. This is all that we have to do because now the PWM module is always enabled when the status is equal to on. <laughs> now, we have done a whole lot of stuff, right? But it's kind of artificial at this point because this is a dummy variable. This is just equal to one all the time. So all it ever does at this point is just do the stuff that it did before. The other one, when it is zero, doesn't get executed at all. But that's where we go back into this one here, into the interrupt service routine. And remember the external interrupt. And all that we do here is we, we really just say, well, status on is equal to one minus status on. There you go. And um, that's really all we need. 
because all that that does is when it was one, it sets it to zero, when it's zero, it sets it to one. This is the same stuff as before. It jumps out of the interrupt service routine and the next time it hits this line here, it's gonna say, oh wait, the clock is, should be off. So turn off all the LEDs, turn off the PWM and go to sleep. Now, one thing that is important is that this button can actually bounce, which means that mechanically, if you press it only once, it can be triggered a couple of times. So we have to actually debounce this button as well. So we can just use our similar variable from before and we call this switch on buffer. And only if it is zero, then please um, execute these lines here, toggle this mode, and also then set this buffer variable to a large value. And we're gonna use the same one that we used before, this 500 in here. And that actually makes sure that there is some additional debouncing going on, that if you press you know, the on off button a little bit too rapidly or too, too strongly, that it doesn't turn it off and turn it on again. But yeah, I think that should be it. Let's compile this and let's flash it onto our pick and see what happens. So we can certainly increase the time. Uh, we can decrease the time, that's just like before. Now what happens if we press this other button and everything goes off, so that's good. Now, can we turn it back on again? We press this button and we can't. And why can't we? If we try this at this point, it doesn't really work because we forgot about one little thing and that is the buffer variable. When we press this button, we're in the interrupt service routine and we actually turn this thing off so the status on goes from one to zero. Well, then this, the switch on buffer value is at 500. And if we go to sleep at this point, we can never ever wake up again because this will always evaluate to false. So we have to go into here and um, into the main loop right before we go to sleep and we have to reset, reset this buffer variable back down to zero. Now, this is a little bit silly perhaps because it means that the buffer variable only works one direction, not the other one, but I still find it to work slightly better this way. And if we do this and we finally program our hex file onto our controller, then we actually see, well, now it should actually work. We can increase the time, we can decrease the time, we can turn it off and then we can also turn it back on again. And our clock is finally working the way it's supposed to work. And we made it. This is how you can program an analog clock on the PIC16 F1455 microcontroller. I hope that this program makes a lot more sense now and lost a bit of its mystery. Let me know in the comments if I should explain anything in more detail and I will do my best to get back to you. And if you haven't checked it out already, have a look at the main video and its companion article on FriendlyWire.com for more additional details. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.